Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains turk and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today's podcast is not just an audio production, but it's also a video episode that you can watch on YouTube at Celestial underscore fit in the Confessions of Bikini Pro podcast playlist. Our guest today is a mom and grandma who fell in love with fitness when she was a teenager. Her first love was ballet, which led her to dance professionally for an arena football league in Alabama. That is just so cool. And then she explored the gym and found her strength and confidence through personal struggles, which ultimately sparked her interest in competing. It wasn't until 2021 that she stepped on stage and earned first in every class and then battled it out for the overall and went on to do two national shows and one regional show before earning her pro card at the third national show, North Americans, in 2022. I was there as well. And (laughs) this athlete is passionate about helping new competitors with their posing. So we're going to be getting into all things new competitors too throughout this episode. So welcome to the show, April Conley. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm awesome. I'm so happy you're here. And you know, because you listen to the podcast, I got to know if there's anything you do or think about or ritual you have right before your heel hits the stage. Um, yes. And it was funny when I've listened to your podcast before, I was thinking, do I have something? And I'm like, yes, I do. Every time. We're lined up, um, getting ready to get on stage. I sit there and watch the other girls go through their routines while they're in the spotlight. And I just can't help but get like overwhelming excitement for them to be able to actually finally put all that work that they've been through for however long their prep was um, uh, in the spotlight for the judges and, and get their little moment to shine. I just get excited. So, you know excitement for them and then leads to excitement for me when I get on stage. Wow, that is really interesting because I personally, if I watch the people in front of me, I learn the hard way. But like one show I was watching a girl do a routine and I went on stage and I totally blanked and I ended up doing like part of her routine. And I was like, <laughs> so after that show, I was like, I will never watch someone again. Backstage, I enjoy seeing them shine and practice. But usually I just try to like, if I start seeing someone practice posing in my eyesight, I like have to look the other way <laughs> to invest in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've never had issues with that. I usually don't even remember what my posing routine is until I start getting into it. My body just remembers what to do. So fortunately I have muscle memory with that one because otherwise I'd bl- I don't remember what I wore yesterday. You know, my memory yeah. <laughs> I think that's a great point too. Like just from a posing perspective, like the more you practice, the more it gets ingrained in you and in your body. So you do have that ability on stage then to get out there and just let your body take over. But I am surprised hearing you say that because you have the dance background. So have you found it to be different or similar? It's very similar for me. It's a lot like choreography. And so the only, the biggest difference is I don't have one specific song that I'm putting the moves to when I'm doing my routine, but I just have to remember my timing on everything. So once I start one move leads to the next move leads to the next move. And that's similar to a dance routine. You, you hit your arm here and then your leg goes here, you know, so your body starts remembering the sequence and and the movements and how they go and so very similar for me do you have particular cues you give yourself or your uh, clients when you're posing and the biggest cue that I give to people and for myself is chest up Mm. chest up shoulders down a lot of times when I see uh, myself included but girls posing um 
the tendency to want to like suck in your midsection and your shoulders will go like this. And then you kind of hunch your back a little bit, trying to make your waist small. And I, I always say, if you keep your chest up and your shoulders down, your waist is going to be in a good spot because it'll look small in comparison to your shoulder width. Because as soon as you pull your shoulders up, everything goes and narrows. And so it makes your waist look wider in comparison. So I love to tell people chest up, shoulders down. And of course, you always have to have glutes high too, but <laughs> chest up and shoulders down. And that gives you that confident look when you get on stage. So regardless of if it's your first time getting on stage or your millionth time getting on stage, you're going to be nervous and you don't want to portray that so much. I mean, the judges are understanding. They know people get nervous up there. But you want to showcase as much confidence as possible. And your body language does 90% of your communication there. So you're going to show the confidence if you keep your shoulders down and your chest lifted. I'm really glad you said that because I literally wrote as a question for you was how I think posing is an amazing confidence booster because you're putting yourself in a position physiologically where you have to carry yourself in a way that presents as like being confident, shoulders back, chest is up. Usually you're not looking down. You're you're either lifting your chin or you're confidently making eye contact. And I think per, for me personally, when I'm practicing posing, I feel like it shifts me into a very confident version of myself when maybe I wouldn't be feeling that way. And I know in your journey, you've really expanded on like how you embrace yourself and, and you've put yourself out there. So have you found body building to have an influence on your self image or your confidence? Oh, huge, huge. Um, starting back when I just started lifting and not, I had, I had zero interest in competing. So I started lifting in 2012 and I am a huge foodie and I love to eat. I love to eat. Mm -hmm. And I started putting on a decent amount of muscle mass to where I had, I knew a couple of people who competed and they're like, Oh, you should compete. And you know, in 2012, um, bikini wasn't very muscular. Um, so they were like, you, you're too big for bikini. You'd have to go do figure. And so I had gone and watched a competition and I'm for me, I'm so girly and the figure posing still is really feminine, but I, I didn't really like it for me. And um, the bikini girls, I was I was just so much, from what I could tell, more muscular than any of the girls that were up there. So I was like, you know, I don't like to eat. I mean, I don't want to diet and I don't like that posing. So I'm just not interested in it. So when I just was lifting, my whole goal was to get big, as big and strong as I possibly could. Awesome. And um, before that, like pretty typical teenage, early 20s, your thought process is how skinny can I get? And it just kind of um, hit me like a ton of bricks that the point of life is not to shrink yourself into nothingness. So you don't take up space and you're not, you're not, your presence isn't barely noticeable because you're so small. Like that, it became more of a, like a mindset shift shift for me and I wanted to take up space and I wanted to be strong and I wanted you know to feel more powerful and um more more important you know not necessarily like everyone's gonna think I'm important but more important to myself those actions in this lifestyle breed I think a mindset of importance in you because it's important it becomes important to nourish yourself in a particular way or to move your body in a particular way and you see that you're worthy of that commitment and you're worthy of those standards for yourself so regardless that like you said if anyone else sees you as important you get to foster that but I yeah. remember you did put in your form something that really interested me and I would like to hear your perspective on like when, when you started this, it was not in your 20s, correct? Uh, no, I had, I was 28. So it was my late 20s when I first started lifting. How do you think competing would have affected your like overall mentality and self-concept 
had you started, or maybe even your mental health, had you started early on, maybe in like your te- late teens, early twenties? You know, I've thought about that in the past and I'm, I'm 40 now. So my, um, and I've heard this before my, as I've gotten older, that once you reach a certain age, you just get more comfortable in your skin and there's nothing more absolutely correct than than that statement that I've ever heard. Like I am so much more comfortable in my own skin now than I ever have been before in my life. And not really because of how I look now, it has way more to do with my self-worth isn't founded in the way I look. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, especially in my teenage years, but definitely into my twenties and my early twenties, um, how, my self-worth and how I felt other people perceived me was totally based on the way I looked. And if I had started trying to compete when I was younger, I would not have been able to handle several aspects. For one, the, the um, dieting phase is, is difficult and it really takes you constantly, not just daily, but even, you know, several times throughout the day, reminding yourself to have a positive attitude towards things because it it can get tough when your cardio is high. Like right now, my cardio is pretty high and my calories are pretty low because my show's in three and a half weeks. And my husband made the comment last night that I have um, so much more peace about me right now than I have in the past. And I said, I'm just focusing on being grateful for everything. Mm. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to, um, you know, go through the suffering, suffering of prep, I put myself through it. So there's absolutely no reason for me to complain about it, which I did in my previous preps. It's like, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. I'm so tired. And I was like, I ruined my experience with the prep myself by having that attitude. And all I have to do is change my attitude about it. And I would not have even thought that wouldn't have even been like a glimmer, a glimpse of a thought when I was any younger, like mm-hmm. just understanding that my mindset and how I am looking at things and telling myself to look at things will completely change my experience with it. So true. It's really incredible. Like anything we go through in life, the way that we perceive it is actually what generates the meaning we get from it and create about it. So we could go through really challenging things. We can put ourselves through challenging things. And in one time in our life, it can mean something totally different than another time in our life reflecting back on it. Like in one moment, it can be devastating or it can be challenging or it can be so struggle. It could be a huge struggle. It can be annoying. It can be frustrating. You fast forward into another version of yourself looking back on that time and you're like, that was actually a blessing or that really created a version of me that I appreciate more. And I enjoyed that. Like we make the meaning by how we choose to look at something. Exactly. And you, you have complete and total control over your, your general happiness with it. And that includes going into your off season because going, you know, coming off of stage, you're the leanest you've ever been in your life. And you're also the hungriest. So mitigating eating, like giving into some of that, those hunger cues that you need to, but not overindulging in them. And then also the mindset shift of going from how lean can I get to how much muscle can I put on my frame now where I need to do my improvements that's not also something that I would not have been able to conceptualize at a younger age. It would have been, I'm fat. That's all I would have thought, mm-hmm. you know, gaining weight from being super lean to a more healthy um, body fat percentage. I would have just said, Oh, I'm just fat. And I need to go back on that diet. Not even realizing that my metabolism needs to recover. My hormones need to recover. I need to re- upregulate everything to where I'm back at a good spot to cut again when I'm ready to do another show. Or if I don't want to do any more shows, that my body's just in a healthy spot. And you don't think about that so much when you're younger. And social media has helped a ton. There wasn't really social media 
at all when I was a teenager. We barely had internet. It like dialed up. <laughs> um, I feel like that's, it's a double-edged sword because it gets so much more information out there for younger people who are competing. So they can kind of get a warning or a heads up or like, this is what to look for. But at the same time, it can also ruin your experiences in certain aspects because some people can be very negative or put out really bad misinformation. And it's hard to it's hard to double check it when you're brand new into the sport or in new into understanding nutrition and exercise. Like, where do you go to double check all these information, all this information that's being put out there? Especially when it's coming out of the mouths of people who emulate what you think you want. Exactly. Yeah. There's a lot of um, gorgeous uh, influencers out there who push a bunch of things that aren't necessarily in line with how they physically look. So they and whether they physically look that way genetically or they look that way because of um, things that they've done. It doesn't really matter because they're pushing this certain exercise or product or saying this is what they eat in a day. And so you get these young kids replicating that and thinking there's something wrong with them because, you know, X, Y, Z worked for this gorgeous person over here and it's not working for me. There's something wrong with me. And that's how I would have handled it when I was younger. I would have been like, there's something wrong with me. Um, I'm not as good as so-and-so and and it would have been a little uh damaging for me as far as my mental health goes it's great to hear your perspective too because you're older and you're looking back on how you would have experienced this so it can help others who are listening maybe experiencing that now to see one it will end and two you can take a new perspective and maybe dive a little deeper into what you're consuming or looking at or being influenced by And I know it affected me, like in my journey, I was like on Pinterest, like, oh, that looks how I want to look. And there's this little workout on it, or they said this, so I need to do that. Or I can never eat X, Y, Z. I'm only supposed to eat this, go on bodybuilding.com forums (laughs) and the workouts and the nutrition are like, that must be how it's supposed to be. But then as you progress in your journey, if you remain open to like your own body's feedback and your own needs from a health perspective, I think it opens up your world to like this journey can be taken with so many different routes. And it's about really you feeling good at the end of the day. I mean, yes, a lot of us want to look better or improve how we look. And there's nothing wrong with that. But not at the expense of how we feel or at the expense of sustaining it long term. And you said that when you were younger, a lot of your self-worth was based in how you look. Was this because of upbringing? Was this because of people you were surrounded by? Or just do you think developmentally that's where you were at? Um, I think it really just had to do with that's where I was developmentally. When I was growing up, I have wonderful parents who were very sweet and, you know, loved on me. And they still do. Um, I still get an Easter basket every I Easter. love that. Oh. <laughs> um, they're the sweetest, most uplifting people. Um, so I really do feel like, and I was homeschooled off and on when I was younger. So I, I missed out on some early on socialization. So when I got to um, high school and uh, I just looked, I didn't look like the rest of the, well, middle school, really, I was a little more, I was a little chubby Mm -hmm. and I didn't think anything of it until I went to school. And then I started getting made fun of for my weight and that affected me a lot. I didn't want to be made fun of for my weight. And, um, it made me very embarrassed. I didn't want any attention at all. I was very shy. And so getting attention in that kind of negative light really, I think focused my, um, energy towards trying to look in a way where people wouldn't give me that kind of negative attention. Yeah, I can really relate to that too. Like I remember all the girls were wearing clothing that I could not fit in from stores that I couldn't shop at and styles that I didn't really like anyways, because I was more like a tomboy. But I think that's because like, I was into athletics so much and I didn't fit into those clothing. So I just kind of took on this identity of like, well, I just wear sports stuff and 
that's it. But really, it's like I can't fit in that clothing. And then other people are calling me mean things or saying mean things about me. It's like, so if I can't have that, I got to improve in these other areas. But it created an unhealthy fixation for me come middle school to high school, high school especially. And I think part of it that I didn't know then that I realize now is you see maybe them getting positive reinforcements or attention that you might want. Maybe that's like certain boys that you crush on or crushing on them, or um, they're able to present themselves in a way that you kind of like or want, or they emulate something, some energy that you want. And you feel like you're not good enough because you don't look that way. But really like it, it, as you get older, you start to realize like your self-worth is so much more in who you are and and how you show up for your people you love and for yourself and the way that you feel about life. And now that you're kind of out of that, you know, high school phase and you move into your dancing phase, I want to go through this part of your life. You become a professional dancer. This was in like your college years. Did that affect or after college years? Uh, after. So did I, that affect? I was actually married with kids. <laughs> That's amazing. That right there is amazing. It, so was, very, it, it like- was a very fun um, uh, stint in my life. And it was very short lived because the team I danced for, um, they uh, folded the next season, which was very sad. But mm-hmm. um, it was it, <laughs> it was stressful, but it was fun. Yeah. How did you manage that? Like you had kids and you're professionally dancing. Um, I had, so our rehearsals and schedules like that, I just made sure I had my, um, my kids childcare taken care of, whether it was my husband at the time watching the kids or if my mom would watch them for me. Um, the most difficult, uh, part of it was how stressed out I got every rehearsal because we did. And my husband was, uh, my current husband, he was a little shocked when I told him we weighed in every rehearsal. No so, way. Yeah, we did. We weighed in every rehearsal or practice and um, we would get fussed at if we weren't tan enough. So it was keeping up the appearance they wanted for the field, which I understand wanting to keep up the appearance, but man, when you, <laughs> when you're putting your self worth and how much you weigh and then having to weigh, and they didn't do it in front of all the other girls. It was just you and the dance captain. She would weigh you and record it. It was very, very stressful. And then the dances themselves were very fast and we had to learn them really quickly. And the, um, getting fussed out over not being tan enough. I took that way too hard because she fussed at the group. And I don't think she was meaning me because when I went back and watched our videos, I um, assumed that seeing myself on the video, I did not assume it was me. I was assuming it was someone of a different ethnicity. So I went a little overboard with the tanning after getting fussed at like that. But that was the, the, my kids were just, they enjoyed it and they had fun. They'd come watch every once in a while the game. Um, arena football is very fun to watch because it's kind of like you mix hockey and football together. So they're playing football, but then they throw each other over the wall. It's very intense and fun. But um, the, the, the biggest stress of anything was going through rehearsals. The only familiarity I have with arena football is from the Kurt Warner movie. Um, I just forgot what it's called. I feel like you would like it, though, given your faith as well. Um, I'll I'll send it to you later if I can remember what it's called. But it's about his life. It's so amazing. And that was the first time I was like, there's arena football? Like, what even is that? And it it is like exactly as you describe it. It's a much more uh, contact version of football very intense it is and we were we would be dancing on the field and so if the ball ever came towards us we just had to like duck and run because those football players would have just piled right through us they were they were not looking at us they were looking at the ball so of course oh my goodness that's such a cool time of your life even though it was short-lived it sounds like it was 
maybe eye-opening in some ways too. Clearly you had a passion for dancing, but being put in that situation where you have to weigh in for every rehearsal and then you have to tan your body so much, like holding up an image is a difficult thing to do no matter what field you're in and no matter what that image is, especially if you don't necessarily align with it or if it's not the most comfortable up image to uphold or not where you naturally sit it's it's a difficult thing to have to manage that but then it's even more interesting to me that despite that you somehow found competing again even though you had you know looked into the figure and you're like this posing's not really for me you eventually came through and started competing so walk us through what that kind of discovery and commitment was like so I, um, m- my late husband, when me and him first met, he had been prepping uh, with a coach that was local to us in Birmingham um, to do a show when we first met, which he ended up falling off of and didn't do the show um, for various reasons. And I like to think it had a lot to do with me and him meeting and dating and he wanted to have pizza and beer night. And I'm like, we can't do that on prep but I didn't know that then um so he was doing that it kind of brought it into my thought process again and this was in 2015 um the idea of competing and uh then we you know our relationship continued we ended we got married and we ended up having um, my youngest son who's five now and after I had him um, he's my fourth baby and, um, all four of them were C-sections. And so I wanted to get some reconstructive surgery cause I'm not having any more kids. And so after I did, I had a tummy tuck and after I got that done, I was like, you know, now I really feel like I would like to think about competing. And this was, My son was born in 2017. I had my tummy tuck in 2018. And so I started looking into it again. Um, And at that time, bikini had started getting more muscular. And when it, uh, 2019 rolled around and the, that Olympia where um, Issa won, I was like, oh, I can compete now. Cause look at her shoulders, look at her lats. Like I was like, I can do, I'm, I can now fit into the bikini mold. And uh, I'd stopped fearing the dieting part of it. And I just didn't know anything. So then I started like trying to figure out how to do the posing and um, practicing in my mirror in the bathroom and, and just trying to visualize myself as a competitor And really what held me back from competing before um, my late husband passed away was he was um, not comfortable at all with the idea of me getting on stage in a bikini, that he, he tried very hard to be comfortable with it, but he just wasn't. He couldn't get past the thought process of a bunch of people looking at me in a bikini on stage. It made him um he was very jealous so it made him not okay very interesting so how did that affect you knowing that you know you really wanted to do this but you didn't have his approval or support behind it really I tried to figure out different ways to make him feel comfortable with it I'm like I don't have to do the small cut bikini bottom I can do a full cut bikini but like I was trying to negotiate ways yeah. to be able to do it and it, you know now having gone through it I know I wouldn't have done well if I hadn't if I had made those um, sacrifices to make him more comfortable I wouldn't have succeeded there's just you're not going to um, find any pros wearing the full coverage bikini bottom because it covers up half the work that the judges are trying to see. And I, it cracks me up now um, thinking about how he was so worried about really men looking at me in a bikini on stage. And I'm like, all the men that are there are just as depleted and hungry. The last thing they're thinking about. It is, exactly. <laughs> they're worried about their stage time, not anything else. <laughs> so true. It's like, 
I think competitors can see it too from that perspective of like, this is hard earned work. Like this is the physique that they've developed. And you're right that there's no thoughts like that. Um, to my knowledge, happening, especially from other competitors, like you said. And now you are with your current husband, who's really supportive, and he just competed as well. And he is a competitor, right? Yes, that's actually how we met. So after my late husband passed away, I was sitting, I was, you know, I couldn't sleep. Um, And so I would lay up at night and scroll through Instagram. And I was looking through stories and Instagram stories does the people you may want to follow. Well, I had decided because right after he passed, my late husband passed away, I was drinking every night to try and get myself to sleep. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to give myself a little grace period with this, but I cannot continue doing this. And I need something that's going to give me that motivation, like a time-based deadline motivation to stop drinking and actually start eating because after that happened I stopped eating altogether um not because I was trying to lose weight I just you know going through grief everyone handles it differently and the thought process of eating just made me feel like what's the point you know I didn't enjoy it anymore so um I was scrolling through Instagram stories and uh my husband showed up as people you may want to follow. And I looked and I'm like, yes, I I do want to follow him. (laughs) He does look like someone I'd like to follow. (laughs) Well, to be honest with you, I was, you know, thinking about competing and he had um, one of his competition pictures is his profile picture. I'm like, Hey, he's a little older because he's, he's salt and pepper um, hair. So I could tell he was a little older. He's older. And I went to his page and he's competing went to his page and looked at his page and he has, he has five kids. So he was a, he's an older um, competitor with children. And I honestly, my first thought about him was let me follow him and see how he handles competing and being a parent and working. Like, how is he doing all of this together? Maybe I can kind of get an idea of what it looks like. So I think maybe a day or so later, he slid up into my DMs, but very sweetly, like I had had other men reach out to me in a a not so sweet manner after becoming a widow, but my husband, he was just very sweet and non-aggressive, which is his personality that I've just Mm -hmm. gotten to know. He's just a very gentle person. But he's very understanding and he just wanted to let me know that if I had any questions or anything like that, he'd be there. And after he said I could ask him any questions, I didn't shut up. So, (laughs) Oh, that's so cool. So you were asking him about how he manages it all. I was. I was asking him about how he manages, you know, competing and and just, you know, different aspects of competing. I was I had um, talked to some local coaches and it started with them trying to prepare myself to compete. And my first thought, my first competition I wanted to compete in was the Nashville Fit Show. Okay. And um, so I was originally prepping for that. And um, when I was talking to my husband, you know, we were just talking at, at that point, obviously, about what my current coaches were doing and uh, how I was feeling about how that whole situation was going, he said I needed to find um, coaches who were more um, invested in the industry at the moment because the people I had talked to who were local coaches had been out of it for a while and they were friends of mine and my late husband's and they were just kind of doing me a favor. Mm -hmm. So I was like, let me find a coach who's up to date with how everything should be going and is going now with posing and understanding how the competitions work. And so at that point I reached out to um, fit body fusion and got on their team. And then I pushed my prep from August back to October. So I prepped most of that year. Wow. That is awesome. Now um, who do you work with from fit body fusion? Uh, Jennifer Dory. Oh, that's awesome. When How she messaged awesome. me after I filled out the app, the athlete application, I was like, am I getting pumped? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> that is really- so special. Oh, she's so awesome. I'm really 
happy that you were able to find coaching that's maybe more in tune with the industry and kind of get your your start and it sounds like your now husband was super supportive of that and obviously eventually things transpired between you guys and you said you've learned that he's really gentle and you guys seem to have a lot of great values that you promote and you share so um how was it for you opening your heart back up after going through the loss of your first husband so um it was very it at first I was like well this this is this is just I'm going to enjoy myself and I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm not planning anything. I don't, it's not like I need a man in my life. Like I'm totally, I was totally happy and confident just being by myself. Um, and but my husband's name is Tommy. So when Tommy and I would talk, it was just fun. And that's really all I thought about it. It's fun. And the more we talk to each other the more I'm like no this man really has a amazing heart and he's really a a fun person for me to talk to I enjoy our conversations um his values align with my values his goals in life are the exact same as my goals in life um how we want to be treated and how we want to treat another person we're right in line with each other. And so it, I mean, it took some warming up for both of us uh, to be okay, especially with our children, because we both have so many kids for us to warm up to being in a relationship with each other. But once we did that conversation got serious real fast because we're like, okay, if we're going to be in a relationship, these are our non-negotiables. This is what I'm okay with. This is what I'm not okay with. Um, this is where I'm at in my life. How do you feel about that? Like we got very technical with mm-hmm. nothing. And a lot of it has to do with our age and having been in relationships before and being able to lay out with each other. Hey, this is what works for me. And this is not what works for me. If that's good with you, cool. If it's not good with you also fine. But now we know, you know. Absolutely. I actually think that's the best approach is one that is transparent and straight to the point, I took that approach with my current boyfriend where I was just like, these are my values. What are your values? How would you handle this situation? And I had a list on my phone of like, what I need to know before I commit to someone again. And I was like, I'm just going to randomly ask him. And (laughs) if it meant that, I'm like, great. And that's, I think that's what made me really like him is because he was open to talking about those things too. Like a man who doesn't want to play games is also really nice and I think it sounds like you guys were both we're going to take this seriously if we're creating a partnership and we're going to become a unit let's make sure this unit's going to function the way we both are happy with and you have his support he lives the lifestyle you guys grew a lot together now you're a blended family is this does this mean nine kids under one roof no no thank goodness no (laughs) (laughs) No, uh, woo. no, we have, we have two that live with us. So, um, my youngest who's five, he lives with us and my stepdaughter who is 17, she lives with us. And my, I have, um, two children who are adults and my 13 year old lives with his father. And then my, uh, husband's children are all adults except for the 17 year old that lives with us. And then he has an 11 year old that lives with his mother. So yeah, we're fortunate enough to where most of our children are grown. (laughs) Seriously. I I was thinking like, I can't even imagine. I know when you, you know, you're a grandma. So I was like, there's gotta be at least someone probably at us, but you never know. She's not even the oldest. <laughs> really? Yes. My son is the oldest. He's 22. But um, Aww. my husband's daughter, who uh, has our grandbaby, is um, 20. That's awesome. That's so cool that you guys were able to join forces, really figure out you have this great connection, support each other, and have similar goals, as you said. So when 
you are thinking about your personal goals. You did say your very first show you wanted to do was the Nashville Fit. You are doing the Nashville Fit in three weeks, which is yes. awesome. and so- it's my it's my second time doing it. So I'm so excited. Um, Returning as a pro. Yeah. Like I'm and what's the best part about it is it being my pro debut and A, it's really close. Like it's only like two and a half hours away from me. So the travel right you know, the travel stress affecting your body is not really going to happen. Secondly, it is one of my favorite cities ever. My -hmm. husband and I love to go there and just like have a little couple's getaway every once in a while. Um, And the pro debut part, it sounds like it's like, oh, that's a lot of pressure. There's no pressure. Like, oh no, I already have my pro card. I don't have any pressure anymore. I can (laughs) like hang back and enjoy and have fun and not be worried. And my husband's dealing with this right now because he's running the national circuit. He started last year and he's doing it again this year is you feel that pressure and no one means to put that pressure on you. They're being supportive and they're believing in you and they're, you know, they're saying you're going to get it and they're really trying to be kind and they are, it's just also makes you feel like if you don't get it, you're letting them down. Yeah. And it being as subjective as a, as a sport it is, you just have, there's no way to guarantee you're going to win. You can only put forth what your best look you can bring to the stages. And the rest of it depends on who shows up and what the judges see. So. Exactly. Like really detaching your, ability as an athlete from the outcome can be hard because you know that like if you've been in this for a while you want to improve you want to be competitive you want to win you also know it's subjective but you're like well that person can win that means I can win too but I have to improve in order to get there and so sometimes when you're close or or you're working towards it and you don't it can be pretty easy to like fall into over attaching to the outcome and I think that's something um, first time competitors especially will struggle with is going into it, maybe with expectations or hoping that they win or hoping that they, you know, just have this really quick road to the pro card before they even step on stage. And that's something I wish I would have known when I first started is like, you don't have to worry about the outcome. If you like the process, eventually the outcome will come. If you stay, you know, realistic with yourself, you take responsibility for your actions and you keep showing up. I really believe everyone's time can come if they're passionate, excited and want that. Um, Is there anything you personally, maybe along those lines or otherwise wish you would have known, or maybe that you instill in first time competitors when you're working with them? Um, Really the first time competitors usually if they're talking to me about posing, my first question is always, do you have a coach? Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I have a, I had a great coach for my first show, but it took me a second to get to her. And the only reason why, I, honestly, I did is my husband pushing me towards finding a coach that uh, was, was um, knowledgeable in bikini. And so my first question always is, do you have a coach? And um, sometimes, a lot of times, actually, the girls are like, I, you know, it's this person so-and-so at my gym. I'm like, okay. Okay. And then they'll, you know, throughout our posing, they'll tell me what their diet. And I don't share what my diet is at, because it's not going to work for anyone else. It's my right. diet. And I paid money for that diet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, so they'll tell me about the things they're eating and, and what their workouts and cardio is looking like. And I will typically, I'll, I will typically say, um, something along the lines of, I still eat carbs every day because they'll completely cut carbs out altogether. And some that may work for some competitors that may not, but when they're coming to me and they're complaining about it, I'm like, there's different ways to skin a cat here as far as that goes. And it doesn't have to be miserable if you don't want it to be. Now, sometimes that is necessary if girls are trying to get to stage too quickly. Yes. But if you have a good coach, they'll be like, you're trying to do that too quick. 
and you need to push it back to give your body time to lose that body fat in the most a healthy way possible as opposed to just cutting your calories down to no carbs and cardioing it twice a day. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I think, um, I wish that someone would have told me that too, like just take the time to build and, and take your time getting into this, set your body up for success. And I think that would have had a positive impact on me long term versus like that I just want to compete so let's do a prep and compete it's like it would have been nice to like have someone on the outside be like "Mm, maybe wait you know you don't have to compete this year I know you want to but if you really really want to you can afford to wait and you can afford to bring your best in another year or another way so um, I think it's great that that's something you instill in them and you know, when you have the opportunity to work with people at that fresh phase of their journey, it is nice to see them kind of have those shifts themselves. Like, yeah, maybe there is a better way or yeah, maybe it will be worth it to wait. Yes, absolutely. And I I try to explain that stage isn't going anywhere. Just get there when your body is ready to get there. Because especially for the NPC, there's a million competitions every weekend like you there's no chance you won't be able to compete whatever weekend you want to compete you may have to travel to it but that honestly is half of the fun of competing is you get to go to a new city and meet new people and make new friends one of my favorite things about competing is all the friends I've been able to make backstage and you know not just on my team but people that we're just backstage and we're like, Hey, come sit with us. And I, you know, it becomes like this little family backstage. So it does. Yeah. I think some of the best experiences I've had has really solely been because of the people that I'm spending time with and connecting with. And I remember at um, one of the shows I did last year, like I didn't know if I would know people there and I just set up in a spot And this woman was set up next to me and we just had the best time like talking about all this random stuff. She told me about all these men she dated and like all these cool (laughs) dating stories. I was like, whoa, this is it's like you just like it's just fun. And then like going to the shows, like you said, like even at athletes meeting, you know, you're looking around, you see all these people who've committed to something you committed to and just enjoying that is really exciting. And you know, now you're entering your pro debut. So you're going to probably have like another new experience and something to um, be excited about and look forward to. But you said that you don't have pressure. So I'm wondering like what your goals are now that you're a pro, like what are you hoping to achieve or experience? Um, For my pro debut, my biggest goal is to show up on stage and, and give the other athletes, the respect they deserve by showing up completely ready and with the best package that I can bring for myself. Um, And as far as my goals in the future for competing, I mean, I would love to say that the Olympia would be on my uh, radar, but (laughs) starting my pro career at 40, it's not as likely if I were to start it when I was younger, Um, but they brought the Masters Olympia back and I can't, obviously I can't do it this year. I wouldn't have qualified for it anyways, but I'm hoping to be able to do that in the future. I'm hoping they keep it. Yes. And bring it a little closer to the U S. Yeah. I know. (laughs) It's like, where is it? Romania? Like Romania. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's a long way, but um, I would lo- really love to be able to compete in the Masters Olympia. That's awesome. I love to hear your goals, and I think it's very much possible, especially because you've found such a love for this. And I think it's great that you have so much support around you. Like even seeing the way your kids support you too. Like when I saw the photo from your wedding of everybody flexing, that was so awesome. Like that was just so adorable and like you have been inspired to show up for them through this journey. So I'm now wondering what was it like for them when you told them you were going to compete and and how's their perspective maybe evolved with your journey? So, you know, kids that they go back and forth with how they felt about me competing because they saw me losing a bunch of weight in the first place. And, you know, 
sparks a little bit of concern for for young minds. Um, so they've been very supportive, though, for the most part. My daughter is a little had a little struggle with me competing for a little bit just because of um, body image issues. Yeah. And I know she was concerned for me in that. Um, but I, you know, continuously tried to let her know this is just a season. I'm not staying this lean forever. I do not want to stay this lean forever. As cool as it is at this point, and I enjoy that part, I also very much enjoy the other part where I've got more body fat and I'm, you know, able to consume a little more calories and and lay off the cardio a little bit. Um, my oldest son asked me when I was going to the Olympia, and I think this was just after my first competition. That's so cute. I, love that. I don't think I'll be doing that, but I appreciate the. Oh, the, that's the, awesome. The there. Um, so the biggest part about how they're, they inspire me is that I want to show up to things that I put, um, that I commit to and put in a hundred percent. And when you're doing something like this public where you're literally on stage and your work is sitting there right on stage and everyone can see it, it's very inspiring for me to have them there knowing that they're going to see me do it and I better show up. Um, and at the same point, I want them to see that when you really commit to something long term, like the the instant gra gratification is isn't a thing in bodybuilding. There is no such thing as instant gratification. And that is one of the best lessons that I think the younger generation can learn is that, you know, it takes time. And with time is where the enjoyment happens and wanting my children to be able to see that. And they're, they're really good about that. Anyways, they put forth a lot of work and effort into everything they do. Um, but wanting them to be able to see that putting in the time and the effort does pay off. Yeah, you've definitely been an example of that. I mean, going from almost a decade of even thinking about competing before really stepping on stage to to doing it and and being up there and showcasing your best and then continuously improving is very inspiring. And when you got into this, you had said you were scrolling on Instagram, but you couldn't sleep. So you were drinking a lot. And I'm interested in how that came about and, and how alcohol was maybe serving you and then how you found like another way to um, cope with what you were going through. Um, so my late husband um, drank every night and he very, he was a very domineering um kind of an aggressive domineering personality and he drank every night really to he had become an alcoholic throughout our marriage so when we first got married he was not an alcoholic he would have a few beers on the like one day out of the weekend and as our uh as time progressed it turned into drinking every night and instead of beer it turned into drinking liquor every night and that's ultimately what took him but I had gotten in such the habit and I should go ahead and explain how that took him. Cause I know that that sounds, that kind of is wide open, but he had gotten into, uh, he had left the house to go buy some more beer and he had, uh, taken a car that was, a uh, souped up a little bit, had a little pep to it. And, um, a cop had heard the car cause it was loud and pulled in behind him Well, he had already been drinking. And now I don't know this for a fact, but I'm pretty sure he had an open one in the car with him. I didn't see that, but just knowing him, that's what I think had happened. And he decided instead of to pull over and get a DUI, he didn't want a DUI. So he was going to try and outrun the cop mm -hmm. and lost control of the vehicle. Um, it went into a culvert and it, um, he flew from the vehicle and that's he died quickly but he was the only one that was in the accident so fortunately um no one else was hurt just just him so um alcohol 
definitely is not something you need to be drinking before you drive because it definitely impairs your ability to make good judgment calls because pulling over in and getting a DUI is much better than dying. Yes. Um, so, but I had gotten into the habit of drinking with him. Now I didn't have any dependency on it. And I know a lot of people do, if they were to drink that often, it becomes like you become physically dependent on it. It is a real addiction. And I had gotten into the habit of it. Well, after he passed away, not being able to fall asleep because I was so accustomed to having him there in the bed. Um, and then all of a sudden him not being next to me, uh, made it really, really difficult to fall asleep that obviously all the emotions about it compounded on top. So I continued drinking every night um, to let myself be able to relax and fall asleep and like, you know, numb those emotions so you don't have to deal with them right at that moment. Now, I would still go through all those emotions the next day. So I wasn't completely numbing them out all the time. I wasn't drinking all day long. I just wanted to be able to fall asleep. So knowing that I needed to stop drinking every night, if I wanted to be healthy, if I wanted to live past the age of 50, you know, there's just things that your body can't handle poison like that for that long before it's just going to give out on you. So so true. Whether it's physically or mentally, it, it takes its toll. It does numbing emotions is not a healthy way of dealing with them. And I had a lot of emotions after he died, the majority of them being anger uh, that I just needed to flush out and deal with. And once I committed to doing a bodybuilding competition and I was able to cut out the drinking and just really deal with those emotions allowed me to heal so much easier than just numbing them and then having them all crash back on me the next day. Well, I appreciate you sharing that story so openly and talking about its impact on you and, and how you utilized it to cope with emotions, but you've since realized that, and you knew at the time, it sounds like that it wasn't the best, but it was just to help you sleep and then having to deal with them the next day, but ultimately like committing to bodybuilding allowed you to let go of drinking as a coping mechanism because you had to for your sport. And then it ended up leading you to other things, which I think is really beautiful story about how positive this lifestyle can be on people. And you overcame as well, like so many other things intertwined with that, like not it wasn't just grief, it was also like, relearning life without somebody and also committing to a new lifestyle that previously you didn't have the full support to pursue. And so empowering yourself to do that as well says a lot. Say goodbye to the post-show blues and make peace with food and your body through the seven-day coaching series that is built to support you in embracing your improvement season. This is a free coaching series that I have put together to support you in eating without guilt or judgment, knowing how your relationship with food, yourself, exercise, and your body reflects in other areas of your life, really get clear on your prep identity versus off-season identity, and finding balance after a competition, as well as improving your body image. Plus, there's even a bonus training for those of you who do enroll, and this is gonna change the way that you feel in your improvement season, change the way you feel about yourself, food, and your body. If you want access to this, you can get instant access to the trainings right now by visiting www.celestial.fit slash post show. It, it was it, my life since um, I met my husband, Tommy, has been really surreal. And I just, you know, I wake up every morning and I'm like, I cannot believe I get to live like, like I get to live this life. I have the ultimate freedom and enjoyment and ability to pursue whatever it is I want to pursue, pursue. And I always have the utmost support from everyone around me. It's just, it, it's really a dr very dreamy. So I, there's absolutely nothing that I, I could ever complain. You know, I complained last prep 
about being hungry all the time. And it just like smacked God. God really convicted me with that. He's like, girl, come on now. You live, you're living your dream life right now. And you're complaining because you're hungry because you chose to do a competition. I'm like, all right, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> That's so amazing that you really have this deep gratitude for the life that has now come out of a life that was challenging and situations that were challenging you since found like yourself and what inspires you and you have this deep faith in it too and in your competition journey you have improved so much and you've grown so much you've exemplified not giving into instant gratification or holding on to it but instead developing your body yourself your mind your emotions, your family life as well. And I just think that that is a really, if nothing else came out of this lifestyle, if there was no pro card, if there was no pro debut, like just that alone is enough and amazing. Yeah, there are so many things to pull from bodybuilding. And, and I feel like sometimes some people have bad experiences with it and they go very public and my heart hurts for the people who have a bad experience with bodybuilding because that's really not what it should be. It shouldn't be, you know, negative. And, and sometimes it is just how you're looking at it. When, when a judge doesn't pick you and they pick someone else over you, the best thing to do is go get your feedback from that judge and find out why and not say, why did you pick them over me? Say, mm -hmm. what? where can I improve? So next time when I show up, I, I have an improved package. And that doesn't mean a higher placing necessarily. But eventually down the road, it will. As long as you keep improving, as the judges say, you'll end up placing higher and higher and higher. Now, there's ups and downs with that always. But getting your feedback and, and continuing to work on yourself instead of looking at it as I'm against so-and-so you're, you're genuinely, what can I do to make myself better? And it has nothing to do with anyone else on stage. Cause you can't control that. Such a good point. I think that this last season proved exactly that to me because I ended up looking the best I've ever looked and I placed not the best I've ever placed. And I, the beginning of the season, I placed well, but the, the competitions I did, hardly anyone showed up. I didn't look my best. So here you go. Here's your second place. Well, there's no one else. So it's like, it's a lot about who shows up. It's a lot about the show you're doing. It's a lot about how you feel at the end of the day. Like if you're making those improvements, that's what mattered. And so I look at like the last three shows that I did this season and I'm like, awesome. I'm proud of myself for that. Like that was my best, even if the placings didn't show it. And then I got to speak with judges and get their feedback. And that is, I think as an athlete, it's very inspiring. It gives you something to focus on. And you were able to place really well in your journey, but you still had to bring something better and ultimately earn your pro status. And your season or before the season you turned pro, you were going through some different things. You were planning your wedding, right? You had just yeah. moved. So what was the feedback you were working on at that time? And, and how did you know you were ready to begin a prep even going through those things? So my husband and I actually <laughs> planned our wedding and our show strategically. <laughs> he wanted to be, he wanted to, um, have our wedding really close. His first show last year was um, two weeks before our wedding. And he wanted his show to be close to our wedding, our wedding to be close to his show because he likes, he prefers how he looks then. And he knows, he, he's like, we're going to have lots of pictures taken. Yeah. And um, I want to look like this for our wedding. And I'm sitting here thinking, Mm, I'm not so much worried about how lean I am for the wedding. Yes. I'm more worried about not having 300 million things to juggle and not being able to perform any of them well. So um, his, <laughs> our wedding pictures are, are beautiful and my husband's super lean in them. And um, then we went on our honeymoon and then coming back from our honeymoon is when I started prep. So I'm like, let's get that out of the way. And then I'll start my prep. 
And so my feedback from um, the judges has been my uh, shoulders, my delts to bring them in fuller to be more balanced for my lower body. So that was what I spent my time last season working on is trying to grow these little baby puppies. <laughs> they look awesome. That was, I'm <laughs> like, whoa, damn, she just lifted them up and bam, those delts and those pop. Like you've done it. And I think it's awesome that you guys planned and strategically did that. I actually think it's interesting because usually it's the woman who wants to be like leaner on her wedding day. But I think when you compete and you know what prep lean looks like, yeah. I, it's like, no, never. I want a little bit of curves on my body for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When we're all standing there back, to the, you know, when you're on stage, that is not how you actually look because you're like, it, it looks like it's being done effortlessly, but it is a lot of effort to hold your glutes up that high yeah. and your back is killing you. So when we're all just standing backstage, we're all just look like a bunch of skinny, loose skinned, like it's not so, it's not as cute. And so, no, I wasn't worried about being lean. Um, I do enjoy having more curves on my body than than show day lean. That's usually for everyday life. That is not my favorite look. Now it's, it's for a point and, and I've tried, and this is how, when I was talking about my daughter worrying about, you know, the body image issues, as far as losing so much body fat. And I'm like, look, the point of bodybuilding competing, is not to see how small you can get. It's to show off how big you got. Like, no, look, I built all of this. I'm going to have to lean down the body fat so you can see what I built completely. But let me show you how big I got. So it's oh, I like that. It's kind of like a back and forth. Like they kind of seem contradictory, but that really is what it is. I spent so much time to build all of this mass on my body, and I want you to judge the symmetry. I want you to judge the the um the development of it, and obviously our conditioning gets judged too. But I want you to look and see and judge all of those things to. Sh- for me to show you what I built, which requires food and body fat at the same time. So, so true. I love that perspective. Like I'm not lean to be lean. I'm lean to show you what I built. And I think that's a really great way of looking at it. Yeah. My, yeah. At my age being super lean is not attractive. (laughs) I think even like, and I'm 27 this year in December, 26 right now. And I think about it, I'm like, when I get lean, like my face looks so much older because it's like sucked in and I like smile and there's so many more wrinkles everywhere because there's just more skin, you know, and not a lot of fat. Yep. Well, it's like that for me, but all over my body, not just my <laughs> I'm like, what is this? <laughs> So I'm so inspired though. Like I, I hope to do and live this lifestyle forever. I don't foresee that stopping And I think it's so amazing that you are competing. And I, I also love your heart and passion for helping new competitors. Like we kind of touched on that earlier, but I want to dig a bit more into that now as to like what really inspired you to work with competitors who are new to the game in their posing. So for competitors who are new, it is such, you're really just kind of like jumping off into the deep end because the bodybuilding world is so vast and it's so, there's so many different parts, moving parts to it. So anytime I get the opportunity to work with a newer competitor, I, I my husband would probably get irritated with me, but I don't, when I pose with them, I charge a certain amount to pose with them, but I don't really put a time limit on it. It's kind of like, <sighs> We're going to pose between this amount of time and this amount of time, just so they have plenty of time to ask me questions, because there's always a ton of questions that go into like what show day looks like, what tan should I do, what kind of bikini should I wear, and they always have a ton of questions. So my, I love being able to help guide them and educate them on just what to expect and how, to, how things are going to look and feel and what, you know, even down to when they're when they're posing and I'm sitting, I'm sitting down on the floor watching them pose. And I'm like, I'm excited for them. Right. I'm smiling. And I'm like, look, the judges are not going to be doing this. So don't. <laughs> you're going to Sandy. You're probably not going to. 
that. I know, right? So they're not going to be smiling and nodding and like being encouraging. They're not going to give that, yes, we like this, you know, vibe. They're just, their goal is to judge your, your physique. And just because they're not smiling and nodding doesn't mean they don't like it. So don't expect that. <laughs> now, Sandy's just a whole different creature, human, wonderful experience for the NPC and IFBB. I adore her so much. And I I try and encourage all the athletes that I, I even just meet to get in front of Sandy as soon as you can, when you can get in front of her because she's the feedback she'll give you is very sweet and very thorough. And she, she, you can tell she's in it for the athletes. She loves the athletes. She loves to love on them. And she takes so much of her time. And the other judges do too. She's just been the one that I've seen come back. So like at the Nashville Fit Show, she straight up come backstage to give the girls their feedback. So yeah. she's she's just a different kind of person. But um, getting them to understand, getting the new competitors just to understand how everything's going to go. So it's not, it's not a surprise when they come to it and their experience will hopefully be a little bit, a little bit better and they'll be able to enjoy it a little more. Cause they'll be like, Oh yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Oh yeah. This is, this is what it's going to be like. I love that. And I think as a new competitor, posing can be very intimidating because you're online and you see these women just nailing their posing and it looks so beautiful. And then you, you try to do it and you're like, mine <laughs> did not look like that. I you think in your body, you're like, I remember when I first started, I was like, I feel like I'm doing that. But then you watch the video and you're like, no, <laughs> that I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, there's something off. So what do you find to be like some of the biggest challenges new competitors face when it comes to posing and how do you help them through those challenges uh really just body awareness is the biggest challenge like you said I feel like I'm doing it but I'm not actually doing yeah. it so the them being aware of where their body is and and I think because of my dance background I had a little bit more um a head start on being able to pose now my first posing looked ridiculous like I looked ridiculous but I, and I've told everybody, you've got to go through that stage because if yeah. you don't go through that stage, you're not going to get to the point where you actually look like you, you're you supposed to on stage. Mm -hmm. And so the, the body awareness, just knowing like I have to say cues to them so they know, and they'll be watching themselves in the mirror, but so they know shoulders down, chest up, or, um, you know, you get this hand sometimes during posing when girls are they're they're literally flexing I'm like okay I can see you're flexing don't flex yeah. <laughs> relax your hands <laughs> so we've gotten some hitchhikers before and um then like clenched fists and you know they're not aware they're doing those things so getting them to relax and not be tense and and posing in front of the posing coach is just as nerve-wracking when you're first starting as it is to get on stage to be honest but maybe even at, not necessarily more but differently because you're getting immediate feedback and being told I'm immediately going to tell you what you did wrong yeah and you, you know that's what I'm going to do and that's a little like for me when I pose with my coaches it's very stressful I'm like ah don't tell me you look horrible you know like you get <laughs> Totally. So just body awareness and having to call out cues to them repeatedly about, you know, shoulders, chest, glutes, and um, the walk. The walk is always a struggle when you first start. Lots of baby giraffes. So, yeah. So encouraging the biggest, the biggest advice I can give to someone who's starting out posing is to um, walk around in heels. And record yourself with your back camera posing mm -hmm. and not your front facing one. Stop watching yourself pose. So record it where you can't see it and then go back and watch it. And after you've watched it, do it again. Fix what you saw. Go back and watch it. Do it again. Fix what you saw. Go back and watch it. So repetition and wearing those heels around the house while, you, you know, vacuuming or whatever. 
Yeah, such a such a great tip. And honestly, like I think it goes back to our very first point too. Like it can bring out a lot of confidence as well, just because you have to carry yourself that way. So you're you're doing things in your day-to-day life, wearing that, carrying yourself a particular way. And you're just gonna gain confidence because you're doing it. So the next time you put your heels on, it won't feel as foreign either. Yeah, exactly. And I heard a good tip not not too long ago about posing and how to bring out your own confidence when you're posing is if you don't feel confident in whatever posing bikini you're wearing while doing it, put something you do feel confident on, whether it's like a different kind of bikini, or even if it's like a, a date night dress and, and you feel like, you know, hot yes. stuff in your date night dress, go put that on and go through your posing just to put that feeling of confidence into your body. Because it shows, it shows immediately when someone's like, when you see it on them that their confidence hit them. Like I noticed it in my own posing. I have a, I have a a physical issue called an essential tremor makes my hands. Well, I shake everywhere, but you see it in my hands and I shake all the time. And when I put on that, I'm like, finally get to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm going to be confident right now when I'm practicing my posing, my even my shaking diminishes. So, wow, that is interesting. You know, I think that being aware of your body, that was a great tip. And then also like wearing the heels around. That's awesome. Gives you that confidence. And I'm pretty sure it was on this podcast that someone said that. I think it was like deja vu. I was like, who, what? I can't remember who it was now. I can't remember either, but I remember hearing that tip and I'm like, dang, that's a good tip to give to people so because that, that confidence, as soon as you hit your, that feeling of confidence, all of a sudden it's easier to pull your glutes up higher and it's easier to have your chest lifted. And, and then you're, you might still stumble because, you know, people are clumsy. I, I've <laughs> fallen over plenty trying to pose, but um, you, you just move with purpose as opposed to guessing where you're supposed to be. Exactly. Yeah. And it it's just like if you're already comfortable around your house in it, getting in front of someone else will feel better too. And you won't start feeling like every session you're starting over um, yeah. because you've just been wearing them. So I think that's great advice. And I think it's awesome you do that. I've also, you know, seen some of your TikTok. So you guys who are looking for some of this too, at the end, of course, we'll share where you can find everything. But TikTok, April's got some really good stuff too. And of course, Instagram. But before we get there, what's your best advice for someone who's never competed before, but would like to, and then your best advice for someone on their road to pro? Um, So my best advice for someone who's never competed, but they would like to really two, two part. Um, First, find a local bodybuilding show and go watch, go watch see how it's ran, see, watch the people actually compete and see if after watching it, if it's still something you're interested in doing. And if it is, immediately research coaches. Don't just find a local coach. And I'm not saying local coaches aren't great. They are. There's lots of amazing local. My husband works with an amazing local coach. But do your research on coaches so you can find one that's going to fit best with your personality. My husband's coach is a great coach for him, would not be a great coach for me. So you got to find, do your research on coaches and talk to several coaches because they'll talk to you. Most of them will, will give you some information or kind of give you and it'll give you an idea if they will work well with you. And my best advice for someone on their road to pro would be to not let the pressure overwhelm them to where they not in they're not enjoying their experience on their way and that's a very tough one because you do feel pressure when you're on that road and you're running the national circuit and when you when you hit a national show and you don't you know if you don't get your pro card there it feels like the pressure and disappointment compounds on you you're putting that on yourself no one else is no one else is is disappointed because you didn't get your pro card just you so try not to let that overwhelm you so you don't enjoy the experience of competing in the NBC because that is a very fun area to compete in yes you know I think I needed that advice today um I just made some changes to like my plans for like my next season and 
I've been reminding myself like I love this so much I love this sport I want to enjoy it and I know I'll enjoy it when I'm bringing my best even more and so like realistically with myself like the pressure to look a certain way and be that way sooner isn't making me enjoy it more because I know in the back of my mind I'm not there yet but to then when I decided for myself like to change my kind of path I feel so much more peace and so much more excitement about it so I just think that that's great advice and I'm sure your husband probably needs that advice too (laughs) you know that's exactly what we've talked about the pressure he feels right now and he's not feeling it for me because we we've talked about it plenty but you know his friends who are doing their best to be supportive and loving on him because he's got amazing friends, but he feels like he's letting them down when he did it. Like, and he placed amazing. He got second in, in his um, 40 plus age class yeah. and then third in the 35 plus age class. So guys that are almost 10 years younger than him, he got third in that. So he did crazy good at his show, but he still felt that, you know, disappointment and I'm like uh we should be celebrating how amazing you just did so love that that is so awesome and I appreciate just everything you've shared on the show and I want people to follow your journey and connect with you and even contact you about working together so how can they do all of that um on Instagram and TikTok my name is the same on both of them and it's April Conley underscore IFBB pro and I respond to messages on either one. So awesome. Cool. Well, I'll put that in the show notes page. You guys, that's on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you're listening now, it's going to be at the top of the page. If you're listening in the future, scroll down to the category section. It's alphabetized by first name. So April will be pretty high up there. Uh, <laughs> you'll be able to find her name, not just see all the links and ways to connect, but you'll also be able to see a full breakdown of this episode in a summary format. Then you'll see a bulleted list of the different topics we covered. And you're going to see episode timestamps. So if you want to go back to YouTube and maybe click on those timestamps, they are clickable there. If not... Just go ahead and scroll back through to your favorite part of the episode or use it as an opportunity to share with others why they need to listen to this podcast. And of course, I always appreciate, and I know the athletes appreciate it, when you guys screenshot, let us know you're listening, tell us about your takeaways, or even message them to uh, share how they how you resonated with their story. So April, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was really like, I'm still living in this surreal life that you wanted <laughs> to interview me I was like oh oh my gosh it was amazing for me you have so much to offer and I learned something from you and I'm grateful that I could highlight your story I'm just appreciative that you're involved in the industry in the way you are because I really feel like you're such a good um, influence on people younger than you and older than you as as good having a good mental health outlook on how to deal with and enjoy the process that we put ourselves through. So I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Like that's literally my mission and my purpose. So to be acknowledged for that and, and appreciated for it it does mean a lot to me. So thank you, not just for coming on, but for saying that and, and for being a listener and to our listeners now, thank you guys for tuning in. Definitely show some love and I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day, night, or morning for everyone in the world while you're listening to this episode. Just make it awesome.